Well, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I'll be uh, talking about NetConf, revamping of the Debian network configuration system today, but uh, before I do that, I first would like to thank Keith Peckard, because he's actually the man that uh, made me do this on my own laptop. I uh, had problems yesterday, it was continuously freezing, so I gave my laptop with the roof console to Keith, then wandered off to the hospital, did laundry, slept for 20 minutes on the couch, came back and Keith had already submitted the patch upstream. So, uh, very productive. Thanks, Keith. Okay. So what is NetConf? Some of you may have heard me talk about it, and uh, I've explained it to some people, but I'll try to do a rather coherent picture today. Um, I, well, I guess the existing network configuration system didn't really fulfill my needs and the needs of users that I had to, um, for whom I had to administer computers. So uh, I sort of came up with an idea of how it could be done differently. And that was about two years ago or something like that. Um, since then, a lot of things have happened, but uh, my idea has sort of like kept solidifying and uh, I'm here to present it today. NetConf is a modular daemon-based network configuration um, system. It's driven, flexible, and extensible. I mean, I'm kind of talking about stuff that isn't really done yet, so when I, when I say this, it's more of a wish list, but uh, I guess I can promise to you that I'm keeping these words in mind, not sort of as a marketing type of thing, but because I really want that system to be something that can be used on a Debian system, and therefore meets up to the high Debian standards in terms of flexibility and extensibility. Um, I want it to be backwards compatible so that you can actually replace your bug down with it. But also su suitable for servers and laptops alike. It should be just a one for all system with the extensible bit added so that you shouldn't have to be afraid that I'm just going to install a 20 megabyte package that does everything network related on your computer. And uh, currently it's actually prototyped in Python. I know uh, a lot of people have complained about that so far, but it's You've been treating me well that language. It's a good prototyping language. I guess the final goal is for it to see if there's a question. So, I had a wiki page up for NetConf, and it's been up there for about one and a half years, and people have been contributing stuff, so from this wiki page, I can give to you a couple of points from the wish list, what NetConf should be able to do. And one of the most important points has so far been that it's stateless. We do not want to keep an additional state value about whether an interface is up or configured or not, because the kernel knows that stuff, so we don't have to keep track of it. And I'm sure you guys know IFUP can sometimes get rather confused about what its interfaces are actually doing. It should be policy driven so that you can be very flexible in what you allow and what you don't and what you depend on and what should happen if that happens and so on and so forth. It should have an interface for user interface that can connect to it. Think network even. A lot of you have probably seen that and I'll get to network. Um, network manager. Sorry, network manager in just a second. It should be extensible because we are actually working on a Debian system here. So if you install a package such as OpenVPN, ideally OpenVPN should provide a file that teaches NetConf how to deal with OpenVPNs as part of the main network configuration so that not every maintainer of anything network related has to reinvent the wheel. Result conf management would be nice to integrate. Stuff like that, you know. PHTP is an extensible protocol. It can give you print information, stuff about your SFTP relay, or even the next app's mirror. Why not start using that? 
There's more. I want non-package integration. With non-package, I mean two-way. Like, as in the, the stuff being integrated can communicate back to NetFarm, not only the stuff being integrated is called upon by NetFarm. Um, features such as link status and environment detection, firewalling, zero cons or linked local networks, Wi-Fi configuration, VPNs, and uh, bridging. And there's a bunch of other things that could be added to that list, but uh, I guess let's not do everything at once. Rome was built in a day after all either. And then the most important point, of course, I want ponies. <laughs> but don't be afraid. I'm not looking to design the like, non unix -y, I'll do everything type of tool. There's network manager for that. Um, I like the Unix way. And we should, I should definitely go buy it. But the way that it's up down currently does it with hooks is just not suitable for every single task. And I'm sure you've seen the problems with it. Even though it does work, it just doesn't do it all the time. So I've been like slaying network manager a little bit here. Um, how many people of you have used network manager? OK, so that's about half. Um, network manager is. For now, you use the fast time. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to happen in my hand. Uh, well, have used doesn't necessarily, it's, it's like. Yeah, yeah, good. Right. <laughs> 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 Ask how many people do use it. <laughs> how many people do use it? <laughs> exactly the same number, Enrico. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right, so network manager is a, is a GNOME sort of. UI or GUI centric network configuration daemon that uh, sits up there in your GNOME toolbar and uh, allows you to very easily connect to static networks and also will list all the Wi Fi networks within range and let you, let you select them and then pick a pass break. It's rather easy to set up and uh, it works in the simple cases like for, uh, for, for various users that basically only ever go to the uh, local coffee shop for a Wi-Fi connection or have wired network at home. It works for them beautifully, but if you try to actually extend Network Manager or try to fix a bug or something like that, you'll find that everything behind that pretty UI is sort of like a nightmare. Uh, and there are certain problems with Network Manager. I, I'm not here actually to like complain too much about it because as I said and I hope I was clear about it, it does work and it does the job beautifully. It's just not uh, for everything. But for instance, you can only ever configure a single static IP. If you want to roam between work and home, and you have static IPs in both, you will have to continuously reconfigure. You can't just simply click and point. Um, policies are hard-coded. If you want to use wireless and cable at the same time, you can't. Because if the cable is plugged in, the wireless is turned off. Makes sense for most people, but just not all for all. So, I guess given that 50% of this of people in this room have used or are currently using Network Manager, <laughs> it is definitely a goal for Network uh, NetCon to provide Network Manager in such a way that the GUI, which is very nice, can still be used. Just the back end are replaced with something that is a little more flexible. Well, and just for to be complete about this, I also want to highlight two other packages that are related to it's up down, which uh, some of you are using. Uh, for instance, who of you have used or are currently using <laughs> it's up down scripts dash zg2? All right, zero. Um, these are actually this is a package you might want to check out if you are doing more advanced type configuration. Uh, it's been written by our very own Mark Faber and. Support stuff like uh, Sitter, like uh, non uh, class ABC type net masks for your network configuration, VLAN tagging, renaming of interfaces, and so on and so forth. And it has a very, very nice feature which definitely serves as a sort of inspira inspiration for NetCon that it uh, actually remembers the code that was, or it, it generates the code to bring down an interface while it's being brought up so you can go ahead and change your configuration afterwards and still get the interface down consistently. At times with this up down, that used to be a problem. There's another package. Who of you have used or are currently using it's up down extra? There we go. Didn't you say you use that? No. All right. I said I knew that. <laughs> okay. So JFS, our very own JFS, implemented that. <coughs> it's a mixture of the uh, link.
detection and uh, location detection network testing, trying to make it easy for you to plug in and just go and also figure out what went wrong if it doesn't work. So I'll definitely call that a source of inspiration, especially the script network test, although I'm not entirely sure whether that's part of NetCon or just a simple add-on. All right, enough of that. Are there any questions up to this point? Good, then I'll uh, continue with NetCon's design. And I just would like to point out that this, these slides and what I'm telling you right now is actually based on a design document that I wrote, and it's available online. So the slides will be linked from the NetCon homepage, which is down here, and you can also find the uh, design document link from there. So the daemon is actually an event-based framework. Everything that happens within NetCon happens in response to an event. Events can include user requests that come in on control sockets, whether that originates by a call to if up or through someone clicking into the network manager UI. That doesn't really matter. There is one control socket that is designed to handle all the, these sorts of interactions with the user. NetConf also talks to the kernel, or listens to the kernel, to find out about interface state changes on the Netlink socket. So it can find out when there is a new interface that appears and then decide whether it should actually uh, bring it up according to the policy. I'll get to that in a second. If plug key is what currently does that. Um, it also could get events from application specific application helpers such as e-advice and WPA supplicants. For instance, if you are losing a lease on DHP or you're leaving the network and WPA supplicant can't keep up the association, then uh, there's an event generated and that one can react to it. All the events are queued with the central daemon, and they can be chained so that you can actually have a rather complex series of events build up and eventually yield an action to be taken, which you couldn't take in a response to a single event because you have to gather information or figure out more details about what you're supposed to do. So the central daemon, I, I affectionately call it the brain, um, has this event queue and simply processes it the entire time. That's the main loop. It's very simple. And in response to an event, it may take the appropriate action, such as getting configuration details. In response to something like an if up request, it may actually, in response to receiving configuration details, invoke a method to do the dirty work of bringing up or configuring the interface. Or it may take appropriate action on receipt of an event such as if the DHCP server can't be contacted and you're actually stuck on without an IP address. But it's a very, very dumb brain, actually, a very dumb queue processor, because all the decisions that are ever made are delegated to the policy broker. And the policy broker is sort of more and more, as I'm, as I'm developing this, uh, things tend to change around. And in, in the beginning, the policy was this like tiny little blob and design uh, image in the top corner, and now like, it's, it's rather big. So it, it's starting to become a more central component. What the policy broker does is that it gives you a way to define interface-specific um, policies, as well as a default policy applying to interfaces that don't override it, where you can say things such as, does the user have the privilege to bring up this interface? Right now, you have to call if up is the user root. But sometimes the actual main user of a machine should be able to do that just from the command line. Why be root? We can delegate, delegate it in this form. What should I do in, uh, in response to receipt of configuration details, such as the DHCP client <coughs> getting all the details? Should I now bring up the interface, or should I, you know, should, what should I do with those data? Policy broker will be able to answer that. What should I do? If there's no static configuration for this interface file, should I invoke DHCP? Or if DHCP fails, should I power off the interface or should I get a link local address with zero path? It should also be able to define dependency chains, saying that for OpenVPN to bring up an interface, I first need ETH zero. So I've been mulling a little bit about how you would define such a policy, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone who's better at language design um, or configuration file design than me, but 
I started out with the nsswitch.conf file, which kind of defines uh, what happens in response to uh, calling several modules, which, which I'm kind of thinking about doing here. Then I briefly looked at TAM and now came up with this configuration syntax. For instance here, um, this is maybe the configuration file, the policy file for ETH0, and it may allow members of group one as well as user two to actually bring that interface up. And if the request to bring the interface up is received, then we start with the configuration source ENI, which is ETC network interfaces. So then one stanza defines ENI, and also says that if we do not find a configuration detail stanza within ENI, then we should continue with DHCP. So that's the next stanza, get DHCP, send some parameters along, and if you get a fail or a timeout event, then continue with link local. And with link local, we don't actually have to define anything because we're just using the defaults. So there's another example, I hope you're, you're getting the picture, and I hope that you may have some valuable input for me on how to define this policy. Um, for instance, this is OpenVPN. In order to get TUN0 up, which is uh, the OpenVPN interface, we first have a prerequisite to if up ETH0. Once that happens through a different policy configuration, we return here and then start at OpenVPN. So then you look at OpenVPN, you see that the uh, configuration file is specified and that if we manage to actually bind to the peer on the other side via an open, uh, VPN channel, then we should invoke ENI to actually configure the link. And then you can see here that it doesn't always have to be ENI, it doesn't always have to be ETC network interfaces, it should be more flexible than that. So configuration sources um, is our next step. Once the policy decided what to do, the daemon may decide that I now need to get some details. And it gets these details from configuration sources. Um, the policy is used to determine which one of those to consult. And I sort of came up with a total of four different types of configuration sources um, in a two by two array. Because a configuration source may be interface specific, such as DH client, which is invoked for one interface only, or it may be generic. ENI, which is a file that defines all interfaces on your system. It may also, a configuration source may also be doing a one-time job, which is, for instance, link local or ETC network interfaces, and then just quit. It has done its, its deal. But on the other hand, stuff like WPA supplicant or DH client may actually continue to run and become an event source. So in the end, I figured out that the best way to deal with this is that if a configuration source is consulted, it becomes an event source. So in the, in the case of DHCP, that actually makes sense a lot, I think. You query DHCP for release, and then you kind of keep on spinning in the main loop until DH client gets a release or gets a failure notification, and then simply creates an event and queues that with a daemon asynchronously, and the daemon can then take appropriate action once it receives it. With uh, cases like ENI, ETC network interfaces, uh, it's, it's a little, it seems like overkill to think about it in terms of an event source, and I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to deal with that, but it could also be a one-time event source that then simply commits suicide when it's done. Enrico? On the other hand, uh, it, so the user can change the file, and Enrico, it's nice Enrico. On the other hand, the user can change the file and then you can generate an event. Upon change of the configuration file, generate an event, and then uh, if the interface configuration changed, then reconfigure it. Yeah, I could do that. Uh, it sounds like a 2.0 feature kind of thing. You know. <laughs> I'll give you the big picture in just a second. I hope this is not too confusing, but I have one more component to introduce to you, um, which are the methods. So far, we've met the uh, event sources, we've met the queue processor, which is the daemon, the central daemon or the brain, we've met the policy broker, and we've met the configuration sources 
Now all of these are currently tied together such that at one point in time the daemon will receive an event that contains all the information it needs to bring up an interface. Now in order to actually then bring up an interface, the daemon invokes methods. And I'm copying from DH client here because uh, what DH client quite elaborately states in their documentation is that everything OS specific is put into DH client script so that it can be very easily portable to BSD, which may not actually use stuff like IP route. Um, I've had some talks with the FreeBSD people about that, and this is one of the motivations why I'm really trying to stay OS agnostic with the design of NetPump. But if, if we actually do methods as shell scripts, for instance, it, the whole thing becomes A, extensible, and B, OS non-specific, so it should be easily portable. I'll define methods to be the only scripts, the only parts of this entire framework that are allowed to actually touch the interfaces. With that, I primarily mean configure them, write to them, but I may also actually decide to read status information only via methods, so that a configuration source or an event source may not actually query the interface directly. That we have an additional layer of abstraction there to make it easier to port to other kernels. The methods get information from the daemon via the environment and return a return status or any form of other information via standard error, for instance, um, and are called synchronously. So the daemon immediately gets a response back because it's a very quick action. We're doing an if config. <coughs> and then there's one uh, challenge that I set myself because I've always been thinking about. Um, about that sort of approach to configuration whenever my network at home wouldn't work. Because if your network at home doesn't work, the Windows way of approaching it is if down, if up. The more Unix type way, or in a, in a more complex environment, the more productive way would be to figure out what is actually currently going on. What is the desired state? What is the delta? And how do I eliminate that delta? So I'm thinking that it could actually be very powerful if we decide if we design these methods to be declarative in that they specify what the final state is supposed to be, or rather get information from the netconf daemon about what the final state is supposed to be, and then simply work to change, to, to minimize the delta between the current state and the final state. So not bring the entire interface down, but reconfigure it. Now I realize this sounds very hacky or patchy or like like a lot of things could be going wrong and my mind isn't set on it but I think it's an interesting idea to follow and unless it fails horribly I think that's where I'm going to go. So now it's time for the big picture and uh, you've met all the players. I've played a little, little bit with XFig here hopefully making the overall picture a little clearer and uh, Let's play through a very simple scenario where the user is asking the network conf daemon to bring up ETH0 where there is no configuration for ETH0 in ETC network interfaces, but the policy defines that if there is no configuration in ENI, then we should try DHCP. In this case, we don't actually get a DHCP at least for, to make it a little more interesting. In that case, then please fall back to link local. So what's happening is that the user creates an event through the control socket, which is used to notify the daemon that's queued with the daemon's event queue. And the daemon says, well, I want to bring up interface 0 now, interface ETH 0, because that's what the user requested. We'll start by asking the policy how to do it. And the policy says, well, start at ENI. So the daemon puts out a request to the configuration sources, in this case, uh, the ENI file, ENI file, and then gets a response back, synchronously or asynchronously, I haven't decided that yet. And upon receipt of that response, it figures out, okay, that, that was a not found. So, dear policy, what do I do now? And the policy says, in case you didn't find a configuration in ETH network interfaces, please do DHCP. So the daemon goes and says, please, DHCP configuration source, would you get me a lease? Now, at some point after that request, 
the DH client is actually going to report, sorry, I cannot fail, did not manage to contact the DHCP server, and it creates an event, sends it back to the daemon. The daemon gets this failure event, consults the policy, and says, what should I do now? And the policy says, please try and link global. And then it issues the request, and link global eventually answers with an event that contains the configuration details needed to bring up interface ETH0. And the daemon then says, okay, well, now I can finally do some work. Now I can finally um, obey the user's command and bring up ETH0, bypassing all the information to the configuration method. In this case, static. Even if the configuration source would have been DHCP, which is non-static, it's the dynamic host control protocol or config protocol, what we get back from it is just an IP address and the gateway and so on and so forth. And we use that to statically configure the interface until something changes. Was that moderately clear? Is, are there any questions about it? Keith. So it sounds like you'll need a new DH client that just returns the lease and doesn't actually configure the interface. Well, DH client can actually do it. DH client can be told to use this DH client script, which then can output to standard out the entire environment in a standardized format. So I can read that back in the sub process and get all the data. And since DH client would have done all the work if I just print the environment, it actually doesn't touch the interface. It's very hackish, but for now it'll do. Um, There's another question. Yeah. You said that the, um, that the method uh, would work uh, in a declarative way, but the method also can fail, I guess. Uh, like, for example, setting default root can fail in some way. And uh, what, how can you communicate that, and, and uh, what's the fallback mode for the daemon in that case? Will it just discard the whole configuration source? Or That's a, a very good question. Um, I'll get to answering part of that question in the next slide, but also what I mean with declarative is that success or failure of the method is determined by success or failure of reaching the desired state. So if, if it finds out that, as a matter of fact, there was an error setting the default gateway, then it could either um, try to figure out why it failed, do something about it, eventually succeed, or it could just say, I tried, but I did not actually reach the desired status, in which case, yes, there would be an error that would be fed back to the daemon, and the daemon would have to consult with the policy, for instance, to see what to do now. Um, I'll get back to, uh, there was another question over there, I'll get back to that in just a second, but let me quickly fast forward one slide here, just to give you an idea of what I mean with, or where I see the ability of the daemon to actually communicate this information about failure back to the originating event source, which is most likely the user or system startup or something like that. Um, I was too lazy this morning to draw a picture, so uh, bullets will have to do. Um, the control socket is very, very simple. It's a very simple protocol. And, uh, I've considered not implementing my own protocol, but and using something like HTTP, SOAP, or something like that. But uh, so far, I haven't really been able to get all the features that I need into these other protocols, so I'm just staying with my own right now. But if there are protocol designers among you or language designers, please come and speak to me. Uh, the client connects to that socket and issues HTTP-like events, requests, which are then uh, actually created, converted to events and queued with the daemon. The event object itself contains a file descriptor that is open and write only, which directly leads to back to the client. So whatever you write into that file descriptor will be returned to the client via the control socket. And in real time, so that stuff like DH client can output its logger in real time. Because a lot of users would actually be bothered if DH client wouldn't output stuff anymore or wouldn't do it in real time. And there's also a markdown callback function in which the processor of this event is supposed to call once it's done to let the client know that, as a matter of fact, this transaction is finished. There you go. And 
then uh, I was talking to Enrico a little bit uh, yesterday and the day before how to do passphrase changes. Like, would we actually want to have um, passphrase changes? Sorry, uh, a little confused there. Passphrase queries, that's what I wanted to say, or prompts. Um, whether we would actually want to integrate those into the control socket protocol, make it a chat protocol. But then I decided that, as a matter of fact, it's a little too complicated to do that, to have a chat protocol that at the same time also allows for real time throughput of status or standard error output from the applications that are being used by it. Huh? So uh, an idea that we came up with was to say, look, I need a passphrase to actually get onto this WPA network. Would you please feed that to me on that newly created pipe I just put into bar run? Here's the path. And then wait on that pipe. After 10 seconds, write into the control protocol like, hey, are you sleeping? Would you please provide that passphrase and then eventually time out or something like that? So I hope that, that actually answers your question about how we can feed that information from the method that is doing the actual work to the client. If there are any uh, improvements you have to suggest, I'd love to hear them. But uh, for now, let's have that other question. I was just going to mention that I'm pretty sure DH client supports DBus, so you could interface with it. That way, I don't know anything about how this works, but right. So DBus, that's a that's a very important word which I've heard pretty much every single time I've been talking about NetCon. Um, it, DBus is a is a sort of IBC replacement. It's a it's a rather scalable way of talking between applications, and uh, provides very interesting features such as uh, authentication or authorization and uh, routing, multicast, and so on and so forth. But uh, I do not use it in NetConf, at least not in the core, simply because it's another dependency. I don't want that dependency. However, I realize that Dbus has, um, is, is very valuable, and stuff like Network Manager actually uses Dbus to communicate. So it is very likely that I will implement Dbus for NetConf in form of an additional package that simply provides the proxy to talk to the control socket. But again, uh, comments welcome. And I think DH client actually doesn't speak DBus. It has its uh, OF, OF something uh, special. DHC DVD, DBus, DH client DBus daemon. OK, OK, so there is a DH client DBus daemon. Which pulls, by the way. Which pulls into the proxy. All right, thanks. Uh, there's another question? Yeah, so uh, a couple of observations about the um, DHCP client not interacting directly with the status of the interface. Um, that's true that you can make DH client not um, bring an interface or add an, an, an address to an interface, but, but you have to be careful that the interface will has to be up before you call DH client or let DH client bring it up because DH client has to, pro has to be able to send packets and receive packets over an interface. Right. Um, this is I ran into that and I was like, oh damn it, my entire design has failed. And then, uh, like, I have to actually call IP link set ETH0 up to get DH client working. But the way that I do it now is um, DH client actually issues a pre init event, and I'll simply take that pre init event and I view with a daemon, the daemon then invokes a method to up the interface, and then tells DH client to continue. Yeah, on the sort of related thing, which is slightly more subtle but similar, the DH client has a kind of implied contract with the DHCP server that if it can't renew a DHCP lease by the time it ends, then the host will stop using that, that network, that IP address, uh, absolutely. So you, the only way you can do this is, is you can arrange the DH client to, to tell your brain 10 seconds before it finally fails before the lease expires um, that it should stop using that stuff and then if, if your brain is not is down or is not talking to it for some reason at the time the lease actually expires DH client should cut the interface and, and deconfigure it anyway because because you have to make sure that whatever happens with this stuff it's the machine stops using that IP address yes. at the time the, the, the IP lease expires. Yes. I, I hope that the brain will still listen at that point in time because otherwise uh, sort of the entire event queue is going to be broken. But if it is a very interesting idea to say uh, like 30 seconds before we would lose the lease after having tried several times to renew it um, to, to actually create an event out of that so the demon could do something. And then when it finally completely fails, when it gets that uh, 
fail event in the end, um, then the daemon has to do the appropriate thing and not stay on the network without IP address. Sure, and I have one more question if it's okay. Um, sure. you, you talked about um, using, doing, at the beginning one of your aims was to be able to get other configuration information like proxies or apps or other thing. Um, which is a great thing, but you didn't really go into any more detail on that stuff. I don't know if you could elaborate if you have any ideas on how that would happen specifically. Do you, do you see a sort of um, abstraction layer on this stuff so that, um, say, a web browser can, can ask, ask uh, IF up down, where's the proxy? And the proxy will have some configuration that says, Okay, if I've used DACP, then you do WPAC, otherwise do this, or look in this file so that you abstract all of that information through the same configuration. Yeah, that's uh, sort of what I was thinking about. I mean, uh, uh, whether it's a control socket command to get these data, or whether it's a, just the file in var run anywhere, like var run HTTP proxy, you can source that, and then you have the HTTP proxy that was returned by DH client. Um, that's to be decided, but the way it would work is simply that DHCP, the DH client thread, includes all these data in the response, in the um, um, environment, if you properly query for it, that's a configuration issue. Um, and then you can wrap these data up into the event object that you feed into the event queue, and if the daemon then gets um, an event that says if up the interface, which also contains information about HTTP proxy, etc. Then simply, for instance, invoke another method, like the HTTP proxy, uh, writing it into file system method, and store that information there. And then, obviously, if that works, my hope is that applications like web browsers or apt will start using these files, similarly to what etc mailing, for instance, has been in the past. So, so something that, that you need to think about early on when designing this stuff is that a kind of big bang approach where you get all this information as soon as the network comes up might not work for DHCP because DHCP packets are very space limited. So there's lots of potential options you could ask for. And if you ask for too many of them, then the answers won't all fit in a DHCP packet. Um, and you can get around that because there is a, there's a, a DHCP, um, basically something that just does query. So you can ask for it. You can go back to a DHCP server and you don't touch the lease at all, you just say, what's the answer to this particular configuration option? But to be able to do that, you, you kind of need to arrange this stuff so that when your browser comes up and says, where's the proxy, then you go back to the DHCP server and make a query, make a query on that, rather than trying to get all the information in a big bang at the beginning and then just have it available. Okay, Th thanks for that information, I didn't know that, and that's uh, something I will have to read up on. Let me just write that down. All right. Thanks a lot for uh, good questions. Uh, are there any other ones at this point in time? All right. I don't have very many slides to go, so uh, we'll have time to discuss in the very end. Let's have a quick look at the implementation and the outlook. As I said, it's currently written in Python for easy prototyping, but because I realized that Python may not be the language of choice for a lot of people, or it may not actually be suitable for embedded systems, for instance. Whether a daemon that configures network interfaces is suitable for embedded systems or not, that's an entirely different question, or at least I'll uh, make that an entirely different question for now. But uh, Python is probably not going to be the final language this is going to be implemented in. So, when I said C++ would be the, lang the real language, then uh, Steve Lang is like threatened to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided that it has to be C in the end. And one way of dealing with this requirement that I would have to actually port a higher level language program written in Python to C was is, is a sort of strict abstaining from all the nice higher level APIs that Python provides. Like uh, I can actually implement a chat protocol over sockets rather than using async chat, which is a module that provides a class with like four functions and you just have an entire chat server up and running within three lines of code. Now I'm, I'm actually doing it manually and if I look at the code now, then all I see is calls to socket, calls to select, calls to some sort of threading library, which to be honest, that's one-to-one -one portable to see. So, 
the only real challenge will be to uh, take the object orientedness because I am actually using OO and convert that to C. But as we all know, you can actually write object oriented code in C. You just pass a struct or a pointer to a struct to every single function, and if you know Python, that's exactly what Python does. Every single class member function starts out with an argument called self. So actually, you know, we could probably like automatically change that code over there. <laughs> in case you want to look at that and uh, convince yourself that I'm not talking uh, crap here, it's all in the, in the Git repository, and that I it switched to Git at the beginning of this week, and I'm sold in like five days. It's a quite an impressive project if you haven't looked at it, uh, should. So uh, obviously this is all a, uh, sorry, just let me hide this briefly. <coughs> this is all uh, linked from the NetConf homepage, which is on ADF, netconf.adf.debian.org. And uh, you can get information on how to check out the code from it there. And uh, NetConf used to be my brainchild until DevCamp 7, until uh, last Sunday, pretty much a week ago, um, when really everything had been like done the waterfall model, like writing design documents and thinking about how I'm going to do it and not writing a single line of code. And then I sat down last Sunday and started to write code and then hit a complete like absolute zero down around Wednesday evening when nothing was working and like the entire uh, structure that I had chosen didn't work out at all and then ended up refactoring a lot and arriving at the current design. But uh, most of the parts that I had written before Wednesday can actually be reused. So what I can say is that right now the uh, NetConf daemon and the client of the control protocol work, everything is handled by events. Every request that you issue to the control socket generates an event which is dispatched by the daemon to a handler. If that handler exists, then it is actually processed upon. And right now, that includes one command. It's called ping. I want to show you that, just so I have something to show. So uh, I'll be starting netconf daemon on here on the right side. I hope that the font is probably a little small, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and I have no idea how to tell RSVT to increase the font size. But uh, let's see. I do have slightly bigger terminals. So. Even bigger. Yeah. Tiny bit. Press shift and uh, left click that. Shift and left click. No. This is this is RXVT. This is uh, this is Unix from like ten years ago. Um, yeah, I can't really, can't really do that. It's, it's ping pong. You don't need, it doesn't need to go on film. <laughs> but I really do want to show that. <laughs> so DF just simply means debug mode. Show me debug messages and F means stay in the foreground. So uh, you see it started here and then it spawned the control socket listener thread. Move the storm a bit to the right. A little bit. Right. Right. Yeah, it's very difficult because that's left is what I'm doing right now. Now it's good. Okay. All right, so it started. It's running in the background now, and then I provide this little like stupid control socket client script, which uh, connects to the socket, which currently just sits in the directory here. You can see the the socket file, and uh, tells me that it is now coming from PID so and so and I actually use PID and the user who, can, who runs and connects to the socket to uh, authenticate and then I can issue a command in here, ping, that's the first line, it could take any number of arguments, let's actually do that, oh great. <laughs> It's uh, not the control flow within the daemon and all the threads isn't entirely perfect yet. <laughs> but we're going to get there initially. Oh, great. All right. All right. So, ping. And 
any number of arguments here, and it then can take any number of parameters. And you see that there, this is actually the daemon echoing back now, so it received that line. And it received that line, and uh, it will also receive that line, until I actually send an EOF. And then what happens is that the daemon says, okay, I got a request, I'm create, creating an event, a ping event out of it, but I don't actually know a handler for the control socket ping event, so it loads that handler dynamically. It's uh, just one Python module, or just one .so file in C, and then passes on the event to the handler, which simply answers to the ping and marks the event is done. And it closes the socket, and the client disconnects, and everything is fine and happy. So that works, that part works, but uh, I haven't really done any integration with configuration sources or methods, but uh, parts of them are already done. For instance, the ETC network interface parser um, was written by Thomas Hood about two years ago, um, and he just gave me the, the code, and I pretty much ended up using it exactly because it works perfectly fine. It can do everything that if up down can do, including the mappings. So you can include your mapping scripts or even stuff like GuessNet and uh, you'll get the correct information out. Um, there's also a DH client thread written, which gets you all the information and creates an event, but I haven't actually like integrated that with the handler, but that's gonna be a very simple task. I have a netlink listener, but I don't actually process it yet. So you see, it's very much work in progress. And uh, I need help. Well, I don't, I mean, I'm having a lot of fun and uh, it'll just take longer if I don't get any help. But uh, if you are a hacker, or a beggar, like you want features, that kind of thing, speak up. Um, I also would love to have people conceptualizing more complex uh, setups. Not only people who come up to me that they actually want like VLAN tagging or rebonding and like doing everything all at once and then VPN on top, and it must never fail. Um, that's, that's a great idea, right? But just <laughs> tell me a little bit how you think that that could be implemented. <laughs> I don't do VLAN tagging and bonding at all. I would love to have people writing unit tests. We can make a competition out of it, you know, for every 10 times you make my program fail with your unit tests, I'll buy your beer. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, people, if you like to document code, uh, there's absolutely no documentation in the code so far. It is Python, after all. It's rather easy to read. But uh, I haven't really bothered with documenting it yet. I think like 99% of all projects start out and eventually never do anything else than that without documentation and I realize it's bad but I've been really wanting to get something working inside of this talk which hasn't really happened except for the ping pong but so be it and then if you actually want to go and write code if you actually want to contribute please do come to me um, I'll show you the code I'll walk you through it to explain it because there is no documentation and <laughs> And then uh, you can have access to the Git repository. So that's all from me for now. Uh, if there are any more questions, I would love if people were to tackle now. Hi, Martin. As you probably know, I'm the co-maintainer of Network Manager. So you were bashing a little bit at the beginning. And I just wanted to say that for the next major release, uh, multiple active connections are a goal. So this will be possible. And another design goal of Network Manager is that it just works. That's the philosophy behind it. And uh, with laptops becoming more and more important, um, I think you completely missed out the part of wireless networking. That's a major pain currently with the Network Manager. So if you plug in a wireless network card, automatically starts to scan the available networks, presents a list of that in the UI. So, and when you uh, select one, it automatically knows uh, which type of, of uh, encryption it uses, and stuff like that. How do you want to integrate that into a NetConf? I mean, it's currently a uh, network manager uses the WEXT interface to interface with uh, VPS applicant and the, uh, the drivers. So what's your goal in that regard? 
Well, um, it, it is true that I could have added one or two slides to my talk about wireless networking because, as a matter of fact, I completely agree with you that it's more and more important and it is also the major source of troubles, I think, for most people in terms of network configuration. Um, I've spent an, an hour over a cappuccino with Reinhard Tarter, sir, retired on, on Irish there. And uh, we, we were conceptualizing how to do that. That was before I actually ended up refactoring. So I was like, with a, I came into this talk with a majorly complex setup of like, like I had to have a section on nomenclature in my design document just to be able to actually make it clear what I'm trying to do. And then we were trying to beat that thing into shape to actually make it work with DH client and with WPA subdivision. And I think, we haven't, we haven't finalized it, but I think that it's possible to do WPA subcontent in the way that you would expect it to do, including the scanning, including the uh, configuration of it, with the same design that I'm using for DH client. Because in the end, it's very much the same stuff that is happening. Um, like DH client needs to get the interface up. There's a pre-init event. You can use that pre-init event to get scanning information, for instance. DH client issues the bound event if it found a lease whereas WPA supplicant can be made to issue a similar event if it manages to get an association. Now I realize that I'm, I'm kind of like making this up as I go, but we did have a rather intense talk and I did spend quite some time with WPA supplicant at the time when we changed from, or they, they changed from the 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 release to 0 0.5 because uh, the new way of doing WPA subsequent configurations via ENI and in Debian just broke everything that I, my configuration. So I tried, was trying to figure out how, to, how I could fix that. And I think through, because WPA subsequent also has a control socket, you can start the daemon and then you can control it as it's running. And you can tell it to connect to new networks and so on and so forth. I think it will fit in quite nicely if I have netconf spawn a control thread for WPA subsequent, which then connects uh, to that control socket, issues commands as needed, and uh, well, that would be actually the method that issues the commands, and then uh, queries or receives events and converts them to netconf events, passes them off into the event queue and the daemon, and lets things happen. So within your design, where would this be in your, in your daemon? Uh, where would you hold the state about the found uh, wireless networks and stuff like that? I mean, the. Uh, I think if I remember, you said you want to completely, completely stateless. And the thing about network manager is it tries to scan repeatedly what uh, net wireless networks are found, merges them. So if there are one network uh, this uh, offer a second or so, it's removed immediately from the list of available networks and stuff like that. So I don't think you can make it completely stateless. No, you have to keep the no. state somewhere. And, you and cannot make it completely stateless, and I have state in here. Um, it will have to keep some state, and if that state is only there is actually a thread running for DHCP on the interface ETH0, it's not possible to do it stateless. But you can do it, uh, you can try to reduce the amount of redundant information. Information that's in the kernel, you don't need to keep it in the file system, that sort of thing. But yes, it, it'll, it'll be a challenge, WPA supplicant, and uh, then when it gets an association, do DHCP and then open VPN on top of that. This kind of thing, it'll be a challenge, but Sorry, that it is. It's getting ugly with all the wireless drivers. It, it gets ugly with all the wireless drivers. Yes, uh, I know. But uh, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, if Netcom doesn't manage to do that in the end, then at least uh, I finally managed to write some code in Python. <laughs> I've been meaning to do that forever. I'm a so developer, but I haven't ever started my own project in Python. So um, this is good. Are there any other questions? All right, there's one up here. Um, I've been trying with, uh, actually doing with uh, a colleague, some uh, bond stuff where we automatically configure which interfaces should be part of the same bond using um, uh, pre dhcp find out which uh, interfaces are connected to which subnets, compare them and, and bond them together. Do you see an easy way of doing that kind of stuff with NetConf? Basically, location auto detection. Is that what you're, what you're saying? Um, it's a prerequisite, it's, a, it's on my wish list. I have to admit that right now, um, I can't point out 
where it would happen. Um, but I think it might be something related to the policy. Like the policy would have to say, um, it's, it's sort of a configuration source if you think about it. Um, the policy would say, like, don't start at ETC network interfaces, start at location detection. And then that would actually spawn a where am I or net, uh, laptop detect or whatever thread which would come up with a location, which then gets wrapped up or changed to the next event to configure via ENI. So I, I, initially I thought of config sources to be a stack, like that's sort of the lowest level information, like layer two, and then layer three is DHCP, and then layer five, whatever, and so on. And that, I got rid of that idea because uh, you want a policy to decide what to do. Like, the stack, the OSI model for that is even workable, but like, it's not always IP, and it's not always um, DHCP or link local. It really depends on the policy. And, but I think that in that model, you can insert the location audit detection underneath the getting IP address config sources. We'll see about that. Okay? I guess my time's over, and uh, thank you all for the questions and for coming, for your attention, and uh, I hope that I'll have uh, a lot of people contributing to NetConf in the near future. Thanks.